Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is the only software your business will ever need. Featuring a suite of integrated business applications, Odoo connects your business operations together so you can get more done in less time. Odoo has apps for everything. CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, marketing, manufacturing, you name it, Odoo's got it. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash this day. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day in May of 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed by Congress and signed by President Chester A. Arthur. This act provided an absolute 10-year ban on Chinese laborers immigrating to the United States. For the first time, federal law prescribed entry of an ethnic working group on the premise that it endangered the good order of certain localities. So let's talk about why this is happening in this moment. Here, as always, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Seems like there's two key strands that we have to keep in mind here, which is one, you know, this well-told story that like a lot of Chinese immigrants helped build this country in the years prior to this. And now all of a sudden we have this big shift in policy. It's an interesting dynamic. But I also think, I mean, note the year 1882. I don't think you can disentangle this from Mm. the aftermath of the Civil War. So let's start there. I mean, what is the economic picture in the decades after the Civil War? And then how does immigration policy fit into that? We've touched on a bit of this um, over the years, but there is this period in the 30 years after the Civil War where the U.S. economy is in a true boom and bust cycle. And when we say boom and bust, we mean it. you would have great times for a couple of years, and then the entire economy would collapse. People would be thrown out of work for years at a time. There's no social safety net. And so you have episodically throughout the late 19th century just – economic catastrophe constantly disrupting people's lives. And one of the things I'm sure we'll talk about is the way that the cause of that economic catastrophe Mm. gets put upon certain people's shoulders. And that results in all of these different laws, including the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act. Yeah. I mean, you could you could do this story for every single ethnic (laughs) group in America. Like when you think about, you know, uh, black Americans and slavery, you can think about Native Americans. Um, You can even think about Mexicans. Like when we think about the West and we think about Chinese laborers, so Mm -hmm. much of the animosity or resentment is pinned upon Chinese labor, either taking people's jobs or corrupting the community or all of these different, you know, um, stereotypical ideas that get filtered through blaming Chinese Americans for the West's problems. There's yeah. one other thing to bring in here as part of the post Civil War moment, and that is the rise of the free labor movement. Because I do think that this, the, the rising idea of labor that should be free, and part of this is used to um, attack and end slavery, um, but it also creates this sense that there are that the most oppressed laborers are the ones who are the cause of the harms to particularly like white workers and so this comes down on sharecroppers um mm-hmm. because they're not uh, acting mm-hmm. as free sources of labor on the market but it's particularly happening with chinese laborers because they are uh, contract laborers and so they're not under the same sort of like yeah. wage and labor system as many white Americans are. And so they're seen as a threat to the labor demands of white laborers. Um, So it's both that like wage conflict, but also this deeper ideological conflict over what it means to be a free laborer. And, you know, we should point out this is not something that just exists in the years after the Civil Mm -hmm. War. I mean, prior to the war, as a lot of Chinese laborers are coming, especially going out west, uh, we see a rise of anti-Chinese violence in states mm-hmm. like Wyoming and Idaho. Um, you know, there's editorials in the 1850s c- characterizing Chinese Americans as morally a w- inferior class and, of course, taking jobs from white Americans, you know, and then in 1858, the California legislature passes laws that makes it illegal for anyone of a Chinese or Mongolian race to enter the state. But then it's struck down a few years later. And, you know, we also get 
these large treaties that allow, for instance, in 1868, there's a Senate treaty that allows for unrestricted flow of Chinese immigrants into the country. And it's just that classic thing we're seeing it play out here, which is like, you can demagogue all you want about a certain group of people coming in to take your jobs, but you also need those people to come and work those jobs because, you know, that's an economic engine. And so, you know, you see that sort of double game happening here as well with the rhetoric and the actual policy sometimes being at a disconnect. We also covered 1871, the the Chinese lynching. It's a massacre that happens in in L.A. in which I think like 18 Chinese people are lynched. Um, And we should also talk about sort of like the violence of the labor. I mean, building the railroad was no easy feat. Mm -hmm. Um, I read a statistic that like three Chinese laborers are pretty much killed for every two miles of track that is laid. I mean, this is really difficult, dangerous work that very few people want to do, but the Chinese are building America in essence, building America's transportation railways. And, um, and as soon as those railroads are complete or those opportunities are, are closed, then it's okay. Well, we don't want you here anymore. Yeah. The, the, the kind of economic calculus that goes into all of these different arguments, the transcontinental railroad was the U.S. economy in the late 19th century, like the ability to connect goods and people across the entire continent, across the entire country, was um, revolutionary Mm -hmm. economically. Um, But when you start to get to these more micro level issues of like who has jobs in certain parts of certain states, um, then you get this very strong anti-Chinese labor movement that, like many anti-labor movements, um, is built not just on law but on violence. Right. And although also mixed into this is the not just anti-labor movements, but the labor movements, right? You have unions and, you know, there's a long history of racism within a lot of unions. And so you have unions rising in this moment. And a lot of those are organizing white immigrants and excluding uh, Chinese immigrants. And sometimes there's Chinese laborers who are helping break the unions and working as scabs. And so it just becomes, you know, this this big mess. Um, One interesting tidbit, not fully related to the story, but it is. It is worth noting that actually the at least the Western economy may have been actually hurt a little bit by the building of the transcontinental railroad, because now all of a sudden the sort of flood of people from the east, the economies of the east and west were a little more connected. And so for a while there, you know, the west sort of had uh, its own economic bubble. And you just kind of tend to think that the railroad opened up the west, but it may have actually hurt the economy in the years after. Well, and the idea of what's good for the national economy and what's good for state economies is different. And we still see this play out over issues like immigration, that there's a real tension, as there was in California in the 19th century, between what kind of immigration we want to our state and what the federal mm-hmm. government wants. And in immigration, the federal government has um, top authority. And that's what we're seeing play out today. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's this. that leads us to this bill that gets um, passed in 1882. So this bill is introduced into the Senate by California senator, right? So we have this classic like state politics versus national politics. Um, John F. Miller introduces it. And You know, I suppose he doesn't really go out of his way to couch this as anything other than pure racism. I mean, he says in introducing this bill, he says, we ask of you to secure us American Anglo-Saxon civilization without contamination or adulteration with any other. There's an economic argument there, but really that's just kind of like, I mean, the American Anglo-Saxon civilization. And talk about post-Civil War context. I mean, there is obviously uh, across the United States in different ways um, movements to create a whiter America um, and to, to limit the definition as much as possible, given the, the 14th and 15th Amendments, to limit citizenship to white people. And it's in the late 19th century and early 20th century that um, Asian immigrants in particular get caught up in this attempt to define who gets to be white. And the Chinese Exclusion Act is part of the process of ensuring that uh, Asian immigrants and Asian Americans do not count in that category. And you see many of the same techniques that are used to uh, discriminate and oppress Black Americans being Mm -hmm. used in the West against 
Mexican immigrants being used mm-hmm. against Chinese and Japanese immigrants, where you have systems of segregation, systems of exclusion, um, systems of disenfranchisement, um, and in this case, also uh, exclusion on uh, from immigration. Interested in the forces shaping our world? The Council on Foreign Relations has you covered. For those who like to look ahead, dive into the world next week, hosted by Bob McMahon and Carla Ann Robbins. We were not forecasting anything about Russian domestic upheaval, and yet that has been the story of the week. These are scorpions going after each other in a bottle. And for those who want to go beyond the headlines, join Jim Lindsay as he opens up the president's inbox. What should U.S. policy do? The approach towards China, it's enough to make me question bipartisanship. And finally, join me, Gabrielle Sierra, on Why It Matters, as my guests and I bring some of the world's most compelling stories home to you. Do you feel good about where we're heading with AI? Maybe we need to invent a new word here, which kind of is a combination of frightened and excited. I'm <laughs> frustrated. Fris- fris- yeah. fris- <laughs> so what are you waiting for? For the, the world, world next week, week, the president's inbox. And why it matters. We'll see you soon. I really appreciate Frederick Douglass in this moment, my historical boyfriend. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> he is, you know, he always has these great lines and speeches, but, you know, he is also engaged in like, this debate as well. And he's speaking out basically against Asian exclusion in the West. And he says, you know, I want a home here, not only for the Negro, the mulatto and the Latin races. This is 1869 where he's saying this, but I want the Asiatic to find a home here in the United States and to feel at home here, both for his sake and for ours. Um, And I always, I always love solidarity. I always love the fact that like, there is a push to sort of say like, listen, this is not just about, Black people's rights, Native American rights. Like, we are all in this trying to survive and thrive and, and be considered Americans. And so the idea that you could exclude, kick out, um, is just as, as painful as it is to other groups who are experiencing the same thing. Yeah. And I think right. he saw a direct connection to the rise of Jim Crow laws and a lot yep. of the sort of legislation taking place, you know, that targeted African Americans for sure. Mm -hmm. And you see some of that in these pockets of Republican lawmakers as well, who have spent the latter half of the 1860s trying to create more inclusive and less discriminatory laws. So Republican Senator George Frisbee Hoare comes out. George Frisbee Hoare, put it on the list. Incredible. It's very good. Very good. It's very good. And, yeah, and, we, you don't get a lot of frisbees, and you can like it because his politics were pretty solid too. <laughs> That's right, Ex- exactly. So he was he was a lifelong opponent of slavery. He was a protege of Charles Sumner. Um, he was a, one of the founders of the Republican Party, and he rightly points out that this law is the legalization of racial discrimination, um, and the ability to see that um, is. So obviously something that Frederick yeah. Douglass did as well. But, you know, it's, it's not a ton of people who are pointing that out. But the ones who are, are connecting the dots in yeah. really important ways. Mm-hmm. And there's this interesting letter that's also written in 1885 by a student named um, Sam Sung Bo. He writes this scathing letter to a New York newspaper in which he's struck by the irony that the United States is erecting the Statue of Liberty three years after passing the Chinese Exclusion Act. So the idea of sort of give me your tired, your weary, your poor uh, does not apply to Asian Americans. Hmm. There's a reason they put that on the East Coast and not the West. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I suppose so. So that's H-O-A-R, whore. H-O-A-R, but George <laughs> Frisbee, whore. Um, nevertheless, this law, of course passes because that's what we're here to mark is the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Chester Arthur initially vetoes a 20-year ban and then accepts a Mm. compromise of a 10-year ban. Um, You know, we'll talk in a second about how this starts to get rolled back. But I mean, the Chinese population in the U.S., which had been growing considerably, it starts to plummet um, from, you know, over 100,000, well over 100,000 in 1880, down towards 60,000 by 1920. And Mm. this period is known as the kind of as what's referred to as the driving out era. And Mm -hmm. I think it's important to point out that it's not just exclusion of immigration, but I think it creates a permission structure for a ton 
of mm-hmm. racial violence. So what you see is then towns picking up this mantle and kicking Chinese uh, residents yeah. out of their town and a ton of violence, as you pointed out, Kelly. But, you know, again, we see the kind of, you know, the fallout on the ground in much mm-hmm. in all sorts of different ways from the law that is passed. Mm-hmm. We also did an episode on that, too, in, in Washington state where they yeah. put a bunch of um, Chinese workers on a ship and basically sent them back to right. China. So we started this by talking about the kind of economic impact of Chinese immigration in building the West. Um, I mean, is this one of those moments where the U.S. really sort of hamstrung itself through this legislation? I mean, you would have to imagine there was a big economic impact here, right? I mean, it wasn't it wasn't good for labor in California. It wasn't great for the California economy. You didn't have the same number of workers, so you couldn't support um, growth in agriculture. There was some hesitancy about investing in Californian cities uh, because of um, a perceived lack of labor. Um, and yet, even though this did have negative consequences for the economy of California, the racist politics behind it were really appealing. That's what the National yeah. Coalition was built on. And so when the 10 years is up, the act is renewed and then it's renewed again. You continue to get these extensions. And in fact, mm-hmm. you see the exclusion of people from Asia grow over the course of the early 20th century, so much so that there's what's known in the literature as the Asia Bard Zone, um, yeah. where like people from Asia could not immigrate to the United States. Um, and so this was the until like wedge. 1965, until 1965. That's how long it took. Yeah. And even then, attitudes have not changed. So, Well, when you have that persistent pattern of discrimination and otherness, that doesn't go away just because you change the laws. And in the case of China, you know, there is a change in the law in 1943 because China was an ally of the United States. It's kind of embarrassing to ally with somebody in a major war and Mm -hmm. say, but you're also not fit to immigrate to our country. So they're like, okay, yes, we're getting rid of the Chinese Exclusion Act. 105 Chinese people can come to the United right. States every year. Look Victory. at how progressive we are. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, it does. I mean, this is in this period of, like, as we've talked about, like very intense racist quotas. Um, yeah. And it's not until the 1965 Immigration Act that you really open up the doors to immigration um, from China, other Asian countries, Africa. Um, mm-hmm. And that has a, a pretty significant impact on you know, Chinese yeah. immigrants and Chinese Americans in the United States. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say just Asians as a whole, because you're mm-hmm. also talking about the Japanese internment camps are happening at that time as well. And so it's an anti-Asian sentiment across the board. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, this is really fascinating. And yeah, certainly, um, I think, sets a precedent for all sorts of exclusionary practices that we see. Yeah, basically for almost 100 years. Um Yeah, and Angel Island, which is on the West Coast, the sort of entry point, becomes a sort of notoriously miserable place. Long detentions, people making a long journey and then being rejected. Um, So, you know, very different rhetoric and reality in that situation. Um, All right. Well, we will leave it there with that episode. Really fascinating. Um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Radiotopia.